Well, the haters gonna hate, 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 and the fakers gonna fake, 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 baby. I'm just gonna make, 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 making luck, making luck. A Dominion Podcast. Hi, everyone. Welcome back for another episode of Making Luck, a Dominion Podcast. My name is Adam, as always, and joining me is Jake. Hi, Jake. Hey, Adam. How are you? I'm doing pretty Hi. good. Awesome. As always, we are going to read off the winner of our last raffle. That was Johnston Jonathan. And I do want to congratulate you on winning the Emperor Scorpion. And also a moment of silence for Johnston. Um, we haven't heard from him since he received the Scorpion. I hope he's okay. Johnston uh, speaking... Jonathan. Yes, Johnston Jonathan. <laughs> speaking of being okay we do apologize if there are any audio issues we were going to record this one in person but the roads are pretty bad and we thought that if another one of adam's co-hosts went missing people might start asking questions it's nasty out there man yeah and you know come to think of it i haven't seen wandering winders since ever um yeah Mm -hmm. no never but okay if Adam's co- Adam keeps going through co-hosts. That's no anyway. bueno. It's not, not right. good. We don't want that. No. Today we are going to talk a little bit about, one, why we think engine is a four-letter word if you're trying to get better at Dominion. We're also going to talk a little bit about Bandit Fort and Wall. These are two negative point landmarks that we think have some similar strategic dynamics. And we are also going to talk a little bit about IRL tournaments and what you will do as an attendee, and how an organizer should approach that as well. Yeah, man. I'm excited. Uh, Yep. But first, I could really go for some bread. What do you think? Oh, oh, man, that's not even a question. (laughs) Uh, So so we got uh, got a few things to talk about from from the last episode of Making Luck, a Dominion podcast. Uh, I think I think we can just uh, dive right on into the kingdom we had. What do you think? Yeah, sounds good. We cool. played it a few times. Tried a few different strategies out. Yeah, so uh, let's let's go ahead and read it. Uh, we've got fool's gold, raise, sage, dismantle, quarry, rats, city, outpost, treasure trove, wharf. We have colonnade and fountain. Once again, for our audio-only listeners, Fool's Gold, Raise, Sage, Dismantle, Quarry, Rats, City, Outpost, Treasure Trove, Wharf, Colonnade, and Fountain. Now, while we're on the topic of four-letter words, I I couldn't help but notice that four of the Kingdom cards have four letters in the name. Oh, there we go. It's clearly the most important thing about this board. Yes. Yeah, so last time... I mean, it's the second most important thing about this board. Oh, other than that it has rats on it? Bottom left corner, that's the most important thing about this <laughs> board. Yeah. Good old Toby. He's yep, look at him. There. So cute. Staring, staring off into the distance. <laughs> yeah, so, so I had said that um, I thought I was going to play big money here. And uh, there was nothing to slow the big money deck down, and it could easily get the fountain points. And I thought that was going to overpower any higher payload deck that you could build here. And Jake, you you were less committal than that, yeah? I was, and I wasn't quite sure what I would do. I was pretty sure it it would involve both wharf and dismantle, no matter what strategy I went for. And I thought maybe you could be cheeky and get some trash for benefit out of rats in the form of raise and dismantle. How'd that work out for you? Well, it's not that it didn't work. It's just that there's something much, much better here. (laughs) And that is... (laughs) That's the deck that actually ignores dismantle, which I didn't see coming. And you play raises, and you usually ignore rats, and you just play raises to trash as many cards as you can. Then you pick up a bunch of cities and wharves and an outpost. And it turns out that outpost really does slow big money down quite a bit. Yeah, so like I said, oh, there's nothing to slow big money down. But but then I realized that if you can reliably kick off on an outpost turn, then the text might as well read... Your opponent, like, skips half their turns because you're getting twice the turns, you know? 
Yeah. And, you know, I thought it would be too long to get that up and running. Um, and, and just about everyone who gave feedback on this kingdom was like, hey, Adam, you idiot. Um, yeah. <laughs> look at this deck. It's broken. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, and Corey. <laughs> Quarry helps it get up and running really quickly, too. Yeah, so, like, I, I diagnosed the errors in my judgment, and they were twofold. Number one, that outpost thing slowing the big money deck down. But but Quarry, um, I kind of forgot Quarry was a card. Without Quarry, this deck takes a while to get up and running. But, like, you just throw two yeah. Quarries in the deck, and you have a million buys from Wharf, and, like, you just you empty the wharves on one turn you empty cities on another turn but which is the same turn because of outposts and then like you just shove like four fools goals in the deck and you win the game it's it's broken like you can empty provinces on turn 10 it's well it's unreal on top of that so you're probably not getting the fountain points but you do soften the blow because you're probably winning the split on colonnade points so i played a lot of this against the bot i don't think i I don't think I like trashing coppers in that deck. You can you can draw so many cards with Wharf. You can just draw past the coppers, so like raise the estates, and then yeah. just buy three coppers when the game's close to being over, and then you have fountain points. I don't know. You don't think you maybe kick off and start kicking off and win the game a few turns earlier by trashing your coppers and saying, screw fountain, I don't need it? I don't think it helps you win the game a few turns earlier. I think you trash – if you don't have an estate to trash and a raise in hand, you just trash the raise, and you spend the money on, like, getting Wharf and Quarry and City okay. in your deck. All right. That's fair. I think uh, getting Colonnade points is a pretty high priority uh, for any deck you play here. Yeah. I like mean I, – I would pick up raises just for points, even if uh, maybe I could get something else. And they definitely don't take up a slot in your deck, so yeah. that's another consideration. Yeah, so this was a really strong case of us being very wrong about uh, the most, kingdom. Mostly me. Can I can I take credit for <laughs> I I think I just forgot Corey was a card. But like I I mean knowing why you were wrong and that you were wrong is a great opportunity to improve your skills at reading kingdoms, yeah. which is important. And we're better for it. We have grown as players and as people. <laughs> uh, also, I want to point out, uh, we did try and incorporate rats into lots of strategies. We tried incorporating it into yeah. a money-focused strategy, and then also into this higher payload deck. And uh, I, I thought, you know, maybe it's got a chance. Like, maybe you thin a couple coppers and you raise rats to keep going. Like, I thought that might be good. It's pretty terrible. Yeah, it was pretty bad every time we tried it no matter what we tried it with you're like oh man you can dismantle rats and dismantle cares about the cost of rats and it's like okay you dismantle rats and draw a card and then you gain a gold a sage or a silver and a copper it's like that's it's bad it's really bad yeah remember how you said that like rats is a very courteous card to use a player like if it's yeah. not good you're gonna know it we knew it yeah we knew it that's pretty bad. <laughs> Granted, I don't, yeah, I don't really think I ever thought it was going to be good here, but it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. So that's that kingdom, and rats didn't turn out to be good there. However, between last episode and this episode, we actually have come across two kind of edge casey but very significant synergies with rats that we do feel the need to at least touch on here because we didn't get the chance to do it in our last podcast episode the first one is one that you the listeners brought to adam's attention and we gave that one a shot and the other one is one i came across in one of my games and we actually played a kingdom that involved both of them so adam what was the first one yeah so uh, uh someone on youtube left a comment uh this this gentleman i'm gonna go ahead and say your name because i don't think you mind uh dylan uh, Dylan has been making a quest through all my older videos, so uh, he randomly will make a comment on a video from like two and a half years ago, which is amazing. <laughs> awesome. And in fact, I'll just say this now. <laughs> he mentioned like he, he was listening to the podcast and he said something to the effect of like, well, I mean, I don't miss Wandering Winter because I'm two and a half years behind. I haven't been affected yet. And I just <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> 
but anyway, he pointed out that uh, we did say rats in training was bad, but if you throw in dominate... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it gets nine points a turn, which it's... is pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty good, and you can set it up pretty fast. I mean, you can gain rats real fast. Yeah, yeah you, that part is not the problem. Um, rats are never scarce if you want them. <laughs> the The problem with that strategy is twofold. Don't get me wrong, it's really good when it works, but your opponent kind of needs to not see it coming if you're going to be winning the game that way, because you need to get six or 14 rats, which means that you need to get 14 of the 20 rats, and if your you opponent... Gotta win that rat split, man. <laughs> I know. If your opponent contests you on it, sure, they might put five rats in their deck, but that means you lose the game. So... I, I think it's hilarious. Like, you could have a three-player game, and you have one guy going for rats training and to dominate, and, like, the other two people are looking at each other like, well, someone needs to do something about this, and I don't want to do it. <laughs> Right. <laughs> I was tickled by that that thought. Yeah, it's it's a more interesting three player game with rats and dominate and training <laughs> than a two player one. A two player one, I think you just bite the bullet if you see it coming and you yeah. see that you're doing that and put the five rats in your deck because six sure, seven seven rats. Seven? Yeah. You, you only need... you only need fourteen. Right. Or, I mean, you need to keep them from getting 14. So. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, seven. I'm sorry. Excellent. So you have seven cards you don't want in your deck, but your opponent is disqualified from winning the game because once they've committed to that strategy, there's <laughs> pretty much no way to pivot or backtrack. That is a that is a commitment to go for that strategy. <laughs> but, but it, it is really fast and consistent, and it gets nine points a turn. So if you do get there, you do win the game. And and I gotta tell you, it's it's really fast when you're playing online because you can just like spam click rats. It's right there. You can play rats <laughs> really fast. Yeah, actually, the other uh, component limiting the factor is the physical speed of playing rats. <laughs> gotta get you that know. APM up, man. Yeah, um, the other issue that that deck has is hitting six to get training on rats which, yeah um is harder than it sounds when you put a bunch of rats in your deck you, you gotta you gotta put a few silvers in uh like three or four silvers because if you don't hit six whew, <laughs> yeah, it, it feels right. really bad and it happened to me once when i was playing around with it it feels bad yeah and then you and then you look like a noob because your opponent <laughs> like, oh man! Didn't they, it's it so didn't work that your opponent might not even realize what you were trying to do, and they just think you're playing rats because you think it's pretty. So the other synergy with rats that we didn't come across until I played a game with it, and I just came across it by happenstance, was rats with boards that involve changeling. Changeling is a new card from Nocturne that is a knight card. Which, if you don't know what that means, it means you play it after your turn, basically. And it has the unique effect that whenever you would gain a card costing three or more, you can, instead of gaining that card, gain a changeling. And that's really good because you with rats, because you play the rats and get as much as you want, and you still get the trashing. And then instead of gaining another rats, you can gain a changeling. And the other effect of changeling is that you can trash it to gain a card that you have in play. It turns out to be really good for big money strategies because you will play your rats to draw a card, trash a card, and instead of gaining rats, you gain a changeling after you have a few. And then you start trashing your changelings once you have a gold to gain more gold. Or if you're building a different kind of deck, you build other components of that deck with your changelings. All right. Uh, calm down a little there, Sport. Uh, you said the words really good to describe that. And... I'm going to go ahead and say it's mediocre. <laughs> like, <laughs> the at strategy? best. I think it's really good. I'm, I mean, Rats and Changeling is great. For big money, though? Oh, man, I don't think it's that great. I mean, it's it's probably barely better than big money with no no enablers. But, like, the, that Changeling is going to be dead until, it, you know, you draw it with a silver or a gold. So, like... It does nothing the first time 
you draw it, which is kind of a big deal. It's better I, than an estate for sure, but like, man, I never uh, had that problem when I played it. Smithy is OP, man. It's not that hard to have a gold by the time you start playing your changelings. Uh, like you've bought, you've already bought a few silvers. Like, it's, I mean, you'll you'll get it, but like, let's say you get a gold every time with the changeling. Like, it's still kind of meh. It's so fast, and it, the money density of it that you create by trashing the coppers and adding all the high quality treasures. I mean, uh, trashing estates. I mean, trashing coppers. I'm still meh. I mean, it's good, but like, it's not like. It's not as good as Smithy. Of course, Smithy is OP, but still. Right, Smithy is a little OP. A little OP? Donald, <laughs> nerf, nerf please, Smithy. Please nerf, please. Hashtag yep. nerf Smithy. But anyway, like, Changeling, it's, some of its best synergies are with silver gainers, things that require you to gain a silver. And Rats yeah. kind of fits in that bucket, because, like, if you're required to gain something and that's not really what you wanted, uh, Changeling is right there for you, man. Yeah, so that is starting to sound a little bit like Traitor in Rats, which we didn't mention on the podcast episode because, you know, it, it has some synergy, but we didn't think it was that strong. Whereas Rats with Changeling we think is a good deal stronger because you don't even have to put it in your deck. Changeling's uh, optional gain effect is present on the board whether or not you've bought it. Yeah, it's a lot easier to make that work. And also, like, I mean, I didn't want to list every Trash for Benefit card in the game. But oh, like, right. cha Changeling Synergy is pretty unique, and I, I feel like it was worth mentioning, and so I'm glad we got to touch on it now. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah. Uh, finally, like, there was one other piece of feedback, and a couple people noted that I beat myself up last episode over saying the word engine. And I was like, man, I said the E word, and I was embarrassed, and I am. Uh, and they were like, hey, why? Why are you doing that? What's the problem? And I feel like I owe them an explanation. And uh, I feel like this is this is meaty enough that we can start to, you know, we can call this part of the meat of the podcast sandwich, yeah? Yeah. Why don't we like the E-word? So I have a few issues with the E-word. And, like, if you, if you say engine, like, it's fine, right? Like, but... But I have reasons why I don't want to say it, and and I feel like they're they're decent reasons. So so the the first thing I have uh, with engine is it has a lot of different definitions. So so first of all, there are games out there like a genre of games or a mechanic of games called an engine builder. Uh, I yeah you know maybe this is local, maybe this is a Midwest thing, but board games are pretty big here, and I hear people talk about uh, oh well what's that game like, and they say it's an engine builder. And that means something. And so that's that term has been kind of overloaded. So when, when someone is new to Dominion and they know what engine builder is and I start talking about building an engine, they have their own definition of what that is. And big money decks fit that definition of engine builder for a lot of those people. So, kind of, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a little bit loose, but it, but it works. Like, they see a big money deck and they're like, wow look how gold combines with gold. It helps you buy province. And like, that's an engine builder for some <laughs> definition. I mean, it's not the best thing in the world, but like already people are misunderstanding just because it is that word and it means something else. Um, and that's touching on the core of the issue, which is that the word engine means so many different things to so many different people. If you get four dominion players in a room and ask them all what an engine deck is, you're going to get four different answers. That's a problem. Like, I, I want to be able to, to convey a certain idea when I say engine. And, like, yeah, it works a lot of the time. But, like, if I ask you what the engine is, if someone asks me what an engine is, I need to be able to tell them something. And, like, does an engine require draw? Does it require villages? Uh, like, what kind of payload do you want? Like, these are questions that don't have consistent answers, and these are the most basic questions. So, like, a lot of times it, it just devolves into saying something like, well, engines are good. And when you try and define engines, you end up with something that basically means engines are what's good. <laughs> and that's, yeah. not, that's not helpful. It's not instructive it, to people who don't know what kind it means. Of a, it's kind of a self-referential definition. It's like using this, the word in – and, like, you, it also really oversimplifies Dominion 
implying that there are these two different kinds of decks and you play one or the other you play big money or you play an engine and we have this mysterious abstracted concept of what an engine is there are different kinds of decks in dominion that go beyond that if i am playing a deck that plays four schemes and then four conspirators and buys a province every turn is that an engine or if i'm playing a different kind of deck that has a bunch of villages and buy and smithies and it buys three provinces but it only does it every now and then is that an engine too what about the decks that aren't doing anything turn by turn but then have one co explosive colossal turn where they buy every all the provinces and win was that an engine yeah and it doesn't the word engine has become kind of this mental shortcut that really stops us from talking about dominion in a lot of the strategic nuance that we could yeah i just i just feel like when i say the e-word i am i'm making things less clear and i want to be making things more clear like that's kind of the point of this podcast right yeah i've, I've had a lot of opportunities to talk to a lot of people and i say the e-word and they're intimidated by it uh, it has this connotation where like you play a million action cards, your turns take forever, and if you screw up just a little tiny bit, your deck falls apart and you do nothing. And like, It's I mean, not true. I mean, some some of it's a little true sometimes, but like, it, it uh, it's intimidating, and I don't want what we talk about to be that way. And so yeah. what I've been trying to move toward instead, I've done a lot of thinking about <clears throat> this, and, and I've been doing some talking to people when they ask me how to get better. And... I, I like talking about this kind of stuff in terms of two uh, terms, <laughs> in terms of two terms that, that I've come up with. And, and they're sort of they're sort of related. You've probably heard them before. So there's deck control and there's payload. And so the idea is you, you can take pretty much any card in the game and you can categorize it into those two buckets right there's the deck control and there's the payload and and you can quantify like this is a deck control card this is a payload card so so what does it mean i'll give you a really quick definition and um we'll i'll link to some articles if you're watching this on youtube we'll link to some articles i wrote that are a more detailed reference into what i mean by this um and if you're not listening to this on youtube check out adamhorton.com they're on my blog it's great anyway deck control is just cards that enable you to play other cards so like Something that gives you plus cards or plus actions. That's deck control because it helps you play other cards. Uh, thinning is deck control. Gets the crap out of the way and junking. You know, that's a form of negative deck control for your opponent. Uh, also filtering like warehouse or something like that. That's deck control. Just enables you to play other cards. Makes it easier for you to play other cards. And then the payload is just what enables you to win the game. So um, examples of payload can be... Money and buys. You can use those to buy VP cards, and you can win that way. So that's a, a form of payload. Uh, you could you could gain cards. In particular, you could gain VP cards. Gaining victory point chits, too. Uh, you could gain other cards that aren't VP cards. If you're aiming for three pile ending, gives you control over the end of the game, helps you win the game. It could be that. Attacking um, your opponent is another form of payload. Yeah. A, a lot of times, I mean... It's, it's definitely part of what your deck does that helps you win the game. And sometimes, depending on the attack, you know, if it's a junking attack, it has a negative deck control effect on your opponent. So you can kind of consider it deck control in that way, but then you can kind of consider it payload because it's the kind of stuff your deck does to win the game. It's not wrong right. to, to think of it in either way. It's just if I want to add payload to my deck, you can look at attack cards and say, hey, this is another thing my deck could be doing. So maybe you do it. Right. Yeah, the bottom line is that we think if you cut the word engine out of your vocabulary, it will in the end make you a better Dominion player because you will no longer have that mental shortcut to hide behind and just saying, this is an engine. Why is it an engine? Because it was good. No, you actually have to articulate, what did my deck do? Why did it do it? How did it work? How did it not work? What was I up against? Things like that. You answer those questions for yourself and you become a better player. Sure. So I, I wanna I wanna put a slight disclaimer on that. I, I don't necessarily think that it's gonna make everyone a better player. Because some people have a mental model that works very well for them and it involves the E word. And like good for you. I mean please continue using it and like as long as whoever you're talking to understands what you're talking about, like 
go ahead and use the word. Like, it's serving its purpose. I'm not you. And I think I think what it does make you better at is talking about Dominion. Especially to other people who don't already know what the E word means. So yeah. I, I think, I mean, that's very important to me because I'm talking about Dominion now on a podcast. Uh, but also, like, it, it can be educational for, for a lot of people. Like, payload and deck control, you can use that to, to help you build your deck better. And it's more quantifiable. And, and it's, from my experience, it's a lot easier to approach. Um, so that's why I want to use that kind of terminology. That's why I say a higher payload deck. The discussion can take place on what payloads are good enough and how you can form your strategy around it rather than around what the definition of the words we're using is and clearing up any confusion there. And also, do feel free to give feedback on that and let us know if you agree or disagree because that, I think, is a good discussion to have as well. Yeah, I'm definitely interested in hearing like what makes people understand things better because that's the whole point. And so, like, if something out there is working, I want to hear about it. So you should tell us. Yeah. yeah. So speaking about getting better of Dominion. Yeah. We are going to talk about some cards that are in Dominion and getting good with them will make you better. Is that a segue? <laughs> that feels like a segue. It feels very forced, though. No, I thought it was good. I mean, I was going to say how like sometimes when i get lunch meat i just like to build a wall out of the lunch meat so no one can get to me but i think yours oh, is better i was also gonna talk about wall meat <laughs> yeah. like when you all right well... <laughs> great segue yeah um so speaking of segues bandit ford and wall <laughs> these are <laughs> these are landmarks yeah in dominion uh, so perhaps we should like read the text of these bad boys. What do you think? Uh, do, yeah, do you want to do it good. or me? Sounds good. Uh, I can go ahead and do it. So first off, we'll read the text of Bandit Fort. And Bandit Fort is a landmark in Dominion. What that means is that it is one of those horizontal landscape cards. There are kind of slots for two of them in every game. And a landmark, instead of being an event, is something that has an impact on scoring, typically. Bandit Fort is a rule that gets added to the game, basically, that says when scoring, minus two points for each silver and each gold that you have. So that only gets counted at the end of the game, so it only cares about what's in your deck when the game actually ends. But minus two points for every silver and gold. That's like a lot of points. Yeah, it can be, definitely. It's a big deal. Yeah. yeah. And the other one kind of falls into the same vein. Adam, do you want to read the text of Wall? Sure. Uh, it says, when scoring, minus one VP for each card you have after the first 15. That's, yeah. that's a lot of VP, man. <laughs> like... It can be. Again, it can be. Yeah, so playing around these cards is interesting, and they kind of bring up in their own way with their own flavor similar challenges yeah so like I, I i talk to a lot of people about these landmarks and like you either love them or you hate them um and i think the people who don't like them uh, are really affected by the the idea of negative points uh, which i don't understand because it i i mean i get it but i don't really understand how it impacts you as a player because if it's punishing you for doing something and it's punishing both of you it's kind of like rewarding you for not doing it so you could kind of look at it as gaining points for not doing it in relation to your opponent's score because your score is relative right it That's doesn't matter true. if you win with a hundred or you win with two if you won sure and i mean i agree with that but i think there's some psychology to back up the idea of like it the fact that it's negative points makes you feel bad. And if it was worded <laughs> in a way that gave you positive points for not having the cards, people would feel better about it. But like, that would, that's that would be not what Dominion's pain. about. Yeah. <laughs> Dominion's about suffering. Yeah. <laughs> Legitimately though, I 
think that Bandit Ford and Wall are cards that you should make yourself play with because I, I personally think they make you a better player if you learn how to play around them optimally. I think that what makes you good at playing with Bandit Fort and Wall are the same principles that make you really good at pretty much every Board of Dominion you'll see, namely prioritization and reading analytical skills, reading a kingdom. A lot of the time, again, Bandit, Fort, and Wall have a greater psychological impact than a mechanical one, and figuring out where that lies for you is a really good exercise in kingdom reading. Yeah, I, I really, I think that's a great point. The The fact that the psychological impact of these landmarks can have, like, a bigger effect than, than the actual one. Because, like, I find myself in Bandit Fort games, like, legit afraid to open silver when it's by far the best card for my deck. But, like, I just yeah. don't want to take those points because maybe I can't trash the silver or maybe I won't be able to. And, like, it's definitely the right call, but it's hard for me to do it. And to me, I think that's the mark of, like, I, I mean, I love Empires. It's my favorite expansion. These are from Empires. Oh, yeah. Mine and too. This, is, this is some of my favorite stuff. These these two, I think, are my favorite landmarks. And it's exactly that. Like, it, it just puts you up against these difficult decisions. And, oh, man, I just love that. So the other thing that makes these cards both feel very different from other games of Dominion on the surface, but in reality are teaching you principles that are transferable to every other game you're going to play, are that most of the time in scoring, you're going to have a point total, and your point total isn't going to care about how you got there. But Bandit, Fort, and Wall do. They don't just care what you got or what you did in the game. They care how you did it and how efficiently you did it, namely. Like, instead of asking how many of card X do I need, you find yourself asking, how few of this card can I get away with? And it, guess what? If you do the same thing as your opponent, but you did it with fewer cards, it probably means you did it faster and more efficiently, and it means you played better. There's a lot of cases where that's true. And I think that that applies uh, to Bandit Fort a little more than Wall. Yeah, right. But but it's true for both of them in a lot of cases. Lexi says Yeah. <laughs> uh, the golden retriever puppy. <laughs> still haven't still haven't given her away. Yeah, I mean, Texas, hello. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that it's a really good exercise as a player to take both of these landmarks, taking the strategic dynamics that we're going to talk about today, take both of these and one or the other of them, play the same kingdom board twice. Play it once with them and once without them and answer questions for yourself like, what was affected by these landmarks? What was stronger? What was weaker? What stayed the same? I think playing that game of Dominion, those two games, is going to teach you quite a bit about the game as a whole. Yeah, I, I think that's pretty interesting. Uh, I mean, yeah. just, to, just to see, like, what kind of garbage strat can be good with these <laughs> landmarks. <laughs> True. <laughs> right. Like, those terminal silvers that usually you don't care about the money, you just are looking at the text of the card, all of a sudden that money becomes the main, like, point of that card. Navigator says hi. Hey, what's up? <laughs> so many fingers. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. For our video listeners, you'll probably never be able to unsee that. I apologize. Hashtag oh. sorry, not sorry. Yeah, and if you're looking at the card and you haven't figured it out, look at both of the navigator's hands. How okay. many fingers does that guy have? Just Same. just count them. Way too many. Right. <laughs> There's no need to go into it further from there. But yeah, let's just not talk about this. Fingers. Just, yeah, yeah, no, it's going to keep me up at night. Yeah. So so I think a, a pretty good starting point like, is the effect of these landmarks on big money. Uh, yeah. That's a significant effect, which is on purpose, right? Uh, <laughs> I would like to think yeah. these landmarks were designed to just give a – to show our favorite finger to big money. <laughs> <laughs> you want to do that? <laughs> you go ahead, brah. So, You're going to lose. Yeah. <laughs> so, so let's talk about wall. So it, actually, wall is pretty easy to calculate. And I, you know, I played a couple of games, and it does work this way. Most of the time in big money, you're gaining a card per turn. So yeah. – uh, if you're 
you know, for the first five turns, you don't lose any points. And then every turn after that, you lose some points. So you, you take the expected number of turns for your big money strategy to get to where it's going to be. So like four or five provinces, maybe. And that's going to be 14 to 17 turns, maybe a little, maybe a little less if you've got some great enablers. And between those things, that's, uh, that's wall. I mean, if you plan to trash your estates, then, then subtract it out. But but I, I found that it tends to be like maybe ten to twelve VP lost to get to five provinces. So that's about a five to three province split. So if you can get yeah. to five provinces and not have to worry about duchies, because it's gonna go real bad if you start to duchy dance. Yeah, uh, it's gonna feel even worse to like add extra treasures because a lot of times late game you don't want to be getting that silver that you would normally get because of wall that kind of thing. Uh, so. Oh. So you really and, want to just get to five provinces pretty fast. And please be that guy who buys estates in the wall game. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's so good. Yeah, it's OP. <laughs> uh, so Bandit Fort, it turns out that the numbers end up being about the same. So you can expect to lose about 10 to 12 VP if you're playing Bandit Fort with big money. Uh, however, yeah. this scales a lot worse than it does for wall. Because if you're playing big money against a higher payload deck or a deck that's not going for provinces, even in a worst case, uh, you're going to be picking up a lot more treasures, specifically golds, in order to keep your deck viable. And those are going to be worth negative points. And a lot of times, uh, it's not going to net you very many points. If you're going to pick up two extra treasures just to get another province or, or increase your money density, you've got two points. That feels pretty bad, man. It does, and even if you have some kind of trash for benefit, like, you know, a salvager is is maybe one of the best case scenarios or a counterfeit, you're still pretty sad if you're trying to play big money there because you're not going to trash all of them. You're still going to lose a hefty amount of points from this. Yeah, particularly with Bandit Fort. I mean, that's you're going to do right. good there, but but I think the point is, like, you, you really can't completely ignore these landmarks, right? You you have to find a way to get points without getting a hose by these landmarks. Or at least hose too badly. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Sometimes there's no way around it. Sometimes there's a junker and no trashing and wall, and you're just going to be sad this game. Like, you're not going to have positive points. Sorry. <laughs> but, again, your score is in relation to your opponent's score. Yeah. So as long as you did better than they did, you are winning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it feels like that's what Dark Ages was supposed to be. <laughs> Winning? <laughs> question mark? <laughs> yeah. That's cultist. You know. Yeah, right. The other thing, uh, some points specifically on Bandit Fort or Wall that kind of apply to one or the other, but not both. Uh, Bandit Fort, interestingly enough, makes early gold gainers better, not worse. You would think that something that helps you gain gold would be pretty bad on a bandit fort board, but it's actually not because you do almost always need to pick up some treasures, some silvers to help you get to price points where you have the cards that you want in your deck if if they're not the treasures. So given that you want quality over quantity, gold is obviously better than silver and infinitely so on a bandit fort board. So anything like wedding or skulk that can help you get a gold without taking the silver bridge up there is going to be pretty good for your point total at the end of the game. You said infinitely so? Gold is infinitely better than silver? It is It is $1, sir, better than silver. Not Which infinite. is... Which is a world of difference when you're talking about <laughs> needing to put two in your deck versus one to get the card that you want. It is exactly equal to infinity. Yes. Yeah, there, okay. is no, there is no way of quantifying how much better it is. It it's is not 3%. It is it's equal to one times infinity plus zero. Correct. It yeah. is equal to rats. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was just going to say that, too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so gold gainers with Bandit Fort. That's, that's pretty good, yeah? Any, anything yeah. else? Uh, yeah, so obviously on Bandit Fort, we touched on this already, but don't, don't think that you can get away with not buying any treasures because 
even though, like Adam said, you're going to be scared to buy the silver in the opener, you probably just need to suck it up and do it. It's, because... it's pretty rare that you can get by with no silver at all, yeah. And don't wait to do it either, because you need to, given that you're losing points on the treasures, you need to maximize the impact of every treasure in your deck, which means you need to have it in, in your deck for as long as possible, which means you probably need to open with it. I, I mean, if it's the best card for your deck, uh, you should get it. You know? Yeah. That's the thing. Uh, I would say with Bandit Fort, uh, strategies that mill provinces tend to get better. And that goes back to the fact that uh, scaling scaling your deck in order to get a lot of provinces is very difficult without adding more treasures to your deck. Uh, if you're not playing a completely virtual payload deck you know, without silver and gold right. entirely. So a uh, strategy that mills provinces <coughs> tends to be a lot better for Bandit Fort. Also, like, those very thin decks with just, like, maybe four golds or, like, four silver slash golds in it. Those decks have reliability issues, but they get a lot better because of Bandit Fort, right? Yeah. So, like, I have this rule um, where, you know, going for intense trashing and, and investing a lot into building a good deck. So it's going to be worth it if your payload is something higher than one province per turn. And I think these landmarks break that rule. A lot of times you, you benefit a lot from building a lot more, even though your payload is just one province per turn because of these landmarks. Right. Yeah, I mean, they, they create really interesting games of Dominion. You, you can't say they don't, even if you hate them. They I make remember, you play differently. I remember playing a game... Uh, I was I was visiting some people uh, in Kansas City that I actually met from the the forums back when that was a thing, and uh, I was playing a game in a rock climbing gym, and there was Bandit Fort, and there was Peddler and Forge, and like there was nothing else that you could do. And normally you wouldn't build a deck that would just like try and buy Peddlers and then forge the Peddlers into provinces, but because of Bandit Fort, that's what we were doing. <laughs> Right, and that was probably the best thing there. I mean, it was better than losing points. I mean, that's it's... always yeah. Well, that's the reason that it that it makes you reconsider so many cards because the you look at a kingdom card and say that's bad. What you're saying is that it's bad in relation to something, and the relate the something that's always there is big money. But suddenly, if big money is not an option anymore. You might be happy about getting Duchess. Mm. I mean, that kid creeps me out. But other than that, <laughs> other than that, yeah, I could see it getting down with the, the Duchess. Oh, okay. I shouldn't have said it that way. Anyway, let's move on. Right. <laughs> so Wall has some kind of Wall-specific dynamics as well. Yeah. So so for for my for my mind, like, if there's Wall out, the only strategy that I wouldn't pursue, that I would otherwise pursue without the wall, is something that trashes very lightly. Uh, yeah. And that's because either I can trash or I can't, right? And if I'm going to trash, uh, I'm going to trash a lot because of wall. Right. Wall actually starts to feel a little bit like Tomb in the mid to late game. And Tomb is another landmark from Empires, which is much more universally loved because Tomb says that whenever you trash a card, you get a point. And that is actually kind of what Wall is doing, too. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, there's kind of like this minimum, Yeah. you know, before you, before you get to there. But yeah, it's, it's very similar effect. The other thing that Wall makes not quite as good are gainers. Normally, gainers is something that says gain this card as part of the card's effect like Jack of All Trades or Workshop. Normally, those are really efficient cards for building part pieces of your deck very quickly, and opening with them has this compounding value of creating, uh, of helping you build your deck much faster than you would have otherwise. Yeah. With Wall, though, ugh, not so much. Yeah, like, a lot of times it's just not worth going for. In fact, I have a pretty yeah. distinct memory. Uh, it was a game that you and I were playing, and it was at GameSwap, and this was when Empires was first coming out. It might have even been during playtesting. There was a game with University and Wall. And both of us <laughs> just decided, like, how bad can Wall be? 
Let's build yeah. these decks that gain a million cards this. with University. There was Jack of All Trades, too. There were so, We had so many cards. It was unreal. Like, I think both of us had a score of minus 30-something. It was the most amazing game of Dominion I've ever played. <laughs> yeah, and then we both looked at that board and we counted our points and we're like, there's no way that big money isn't just the best thing here. It was it was embarrassing. It was it was amazing. Like I we ended oh, yeah. it on piles too. <laughs> like Oh god, did we really? Oh yeah. All oh, of the piles were in our deck. There were no points. But I no, had like just we each had like wall. two or three provinces, and it was it was a, a disaster. It was amazing. Don't don't do that. I mean, I it was wonder, fun. Like, <laughs> thematically, what's going on with wall? Oh, like, I'm not really sure what wall means. Like, why are you losing points for having more cards? Oh, because uh, if you have more stuff in your kingdom, at the end you have to build a wall around it to protect it, and it's expensive to build that wall because there's so much crap to build it around. Oh, yeah. Okay. Theme is very important to Dominion. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. It is, like Duchess. Oh my god. Please, no. I'm trying Duchess to start... Is amazing. I'm, I'm a married man, and I am not married to that Duchess. And, like, is no. that is that kid mine? I don't want her showing up in my door with that kid, trying to ruin I... what I've got. Like, I'm happy with my wife, okay? I love the idea of Duchess, because you buy a duchy... And then you get the Duchess. It's like, I just bought claim to this land. Oh, look, there's a woman in it. <laughs> and now I own it's the pretty... woman? Like... And now I own the woman, too, because I bought the <laughs> land. We are in 1900s Germany or something. Uh, maybe, like, 1800s. I don't really know my history. <laughs> We're in 1900s Germany. Not 1900s Germany. <laughs> Like 1700s Germany, maybe. You heard it here first, kids. <laughs> no, please, I don't hate the German people. Um, I just hate the 1900s. <laughs> right, in general. <sighs> yeah, so the other thing... Oh, and this comes back to Bandit Fort. Um, these are some card-specific interactions, which we don't always get into, but <laughs> these yes. are really significant. Yeah. Bandit Fort makes certain cards that aren't usually attacks into attacks. Namely, I'm talking about Embassy and, to a greater degree, Governor. Greater? So, a greater degree. All right, let's I hear do, this one. I, okay, so both of these cards have some way of making your opponent gain a silver, and that's actually, for the most part, considered to be a benefit to your opponent. Yeah, uh, oh, it's you, good you card, can argue silver. one way or the other. Yeah, I mean, like, a lot of the time you don't want silver in your deck, and it sucks. <clears game. throat> I'm but... sorry, did you say a lot of the time? Some of the time. There are some times when you don't a, want the silver. A small when you'd rather fraction have of the time, like 10% right. or less. But and it's you, a lot less. Spoilers. Go but ahead. If, that, if there was a card in Dominion that had an option of making your opponent lose two points... That would be a pretty amazing attack That's pretty if you good, think yeah. about it. Yeah. So, I mean, they could trash it, given, but uh, Governor especially because while your opponent's doing that, they're putting golds into their deck, which they're going to trash with Governors into provinces, and that's their road to victory. And they flooded you with silver, and what is that silver doing for you? You don't have that same road. You could trash it into Governors, I guess, and start doing the same thing to them, but most of the trashing is probably happening on their turn because they have the governors to be flooding you with silver and they flooded you with silver. So not only are you at the mercy of losing all these bandit four points to governor, you're also just watching your opponent do what they need to do and deny you doing what you need to do at the same time. Okay. So like, I mean, you're not wrong, but pretty much all of that stuff is true. Even if, there's no bandit for it because like i'm losing two points for the gold you're losing two points for the silver gold is better than silver in all games so like i don't really think it, it magnifies it that much with governor maybe maybe i mean but that comes back to bandit fort and wall kind of being a very illustrative microcosm of dominion at large okay um, that's, I, you got a point. I think a lot i think a lot of things that are very obvious with bandit fort and wall are also true of every other game in Dominion. They're just more subtle. Yeah, you have, you have a good point there. That's a good point. 
Uh, Embassy is doing the same thing, but I don't think there's a whole lot more to say about it other than the same points with Governor. Embassy's a good card. Yeah, other than that, Embassy's a good card. I mean, it's it's good even if the silver is good for your opponents, which, like, it is. Yeah. But maybe not with Bandit Fort. <laughs> yeah, so Bandit Fort and Wall, I think of sometimes about another game that I really like to play called Splendor. And Splendor is a game of gaining victory points and using cards to do it. And if you tie your opponent on points in Splendor, the tiebreaker, the person who wins the game, is the person who had the fewest cards. In other words, the person who did more with less. And that's kind of what Bandit Fort and Wall are pushing you toward as well. I'm sorry, you said that Dominion is like Splendor. Because well, it's, it's not... a game where you use cards <laughs> to get victory points. Look, it's not a perfect so, analogy. <laughs> so they're, they're so they're exactly the same game, is what I'm hearing, right? Yep. yep. So I'm Dominion gonna take Splendor. I'm gonna take my Splendor deck and I'm gonna shuffle it with my Dominion deck, and we're we're doing this, okay? Wednesday is happening. Right. Okay. <laughs> yep. I'm bringing yeah. Splendor, okay. and we'll, we'll play a kingdom with like some Splendor cards on it, like five Splendor piles. Oh man. <laughs> and then five Dominion cool. piles. Do I buy the wine merchant or do I buy the onyx? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and I'm not even gonna sleeve the splendor cards, okay? <laughs> Dominion sleeved, splendor not. I'm pretty sure they're wider, so it's probably I don't fine, think right? They're the same size. <laughs> they're they're not. It's fine. Don't nobles. worry about it. Are the nobles the landmarks or? Uh yeah sure the nobles. Whatever. No 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 the nobles are nobles. What are you talking about? Oh right. <laughs> Oh, yeah, there's a pile. You have the pile of nobles, and every now and then in the nobles, it's like standing yeah. up where like shoved a piece of cardboard that's a noble from Splendor. In your that's head. it. We did it. Oh, this we is the best Dominion. thing ever. No, 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 no. We made Dominion amazing. We made Dominion great again with our wall. <laughs> with our wall. Um, so, oh, that was so good. Yeah. That was amazing. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, I feel like we've touched on the main points of Bandit Fort and Wall. I think yeah. they were a great addition to Dominion. I think Empires was a great addition oh, to Dominion. I love that expansion so much. It's my favorite one, by a lot. Yeah, I, me too. I think it added as much to Dominion as, like, the last four or five expansions had. It, it is amazing, and if you are playing Dominion and you are buying expansions and you don't have all of them yet... Definitely consider Empires as the next one you buy. I yeah. think that you're going to have a lot of fun with it. Yeah. It's like when people ask me for their first expansion, I say Seaside. And then after that, I'm like, get Empires. I think you can skip Seaside and just get Empires. Because, like, if you're you only going to... You probably gonna... can, yeah. Yeah. Like, it's so... It, it, it shows you everything Dominion could be, everything Dominion's capable of, the potential of this design space that Donald X can explore. and. Oh feels so good man yeah i mean it's we're, we're on a bit of a tangent now but I don't think <laughs> this whole podcast is a tangent <laughs> yeah it's a tangent from your life making look a tangent podcast <laughs> a tangential podcast so speaking of tangents and lunch meat <laughs> yeah we're gonna talk about tournaments <laughs> which are both yeah. of those things yeah and uh, Adam has a lot to say about hosting tournaments and organizing them because he's been doing that for a very long time. But what I am going to go into first, because we're going to be on the topic, are some points of etiquette and tips for somebody at a tournament, attending one and competing in it. And With I'm physical just gonna cards, it. right? Yeah, with physical cards. A lot of this applies to any game you play in real life with other players, but this is specific to Dominion tournaments, and I'm sticking to the stuff that I think it's hard to argue with. So um, first off, when you're at a tournament, the first thing you should do, or at some point during the event, is make sure you thank your TO, tournament organizer, for his or her time and energy. I have never organized a tournament of Dominion, but I have organized tournaments for other games, and I have watched Adam and other people organize tournaments of Dominion. However much work you think it is, I promise you, it's more. Uh, it's a it's an insane amount of time and energy and preparation that goes into it, so say thank you for making that possible. Uh, point number two, 
when you are at the tournament, do not talk about the boards that you have played. Don't don't gush about the kingdoms until you are 100% certain that you're not within earshot of somebody else who's about to play that board. You might accidentally give your somebody else familiarity with the board that their opponent didn't have, and that's not cool. It's easy to do on accident, but like, also, yeah, it's a problem. When, yeah. Just be cognizant of it. Just and when the event's over, talk about it all you want. Or maybe you, they're they're cutting to the top eight or whatever, and it's and nobody's going to play it. Then feel free to talk about it, but not before. Yeah. Uh, when you sit down with a new opponent, don't be player one and player two. Introduce yourself. You know, shake hands, <laughs> smile. Your people just look each other in the <laughs> eye. There's no reason you can't be friends. Uh, speaking of, and this is a big one. And we are all guilty of this. Don't, but at a tournament, make sure you don't rage and you don't blame luck for how you do. I know that luck is an aspect of Dominion. You're shuffling cards. Yeah, you know yeah, but we all have those thoughts sometimes. And even if it's true, just keep it to yourself because you don't want to minimize the role your opponent's skill has on the outcome of the game and you don't want to minimize your opponent. It's just good behavior. Uh, speaking of good behavior to your opponent, don't try to rush them. Don't try to make them take their turns faster than they want to. And don't slow roll your own turns or try to stall for time. Your opponent has the right to take his or her turns at the pace they're comfortable with. And at the same time, you both have a responsibility to try to finish the match in the time allotted. So just don't take more, more or less time than you need. Yeah, it's, and, it's the TO's problem to make sure that goes smoothly. You know, just doing your own part is good enough, I think. Yeah. Uh, when you're interacting with the TO, if you have a rules question and the TO says something that you disagree with, just accept it. Even if you're right, and you might not be, the TO is probably right, but even if you <laughs> are, by enrolling in the tournament, you need to understand that you have accepted the TO's authority on if not Dominion, that event. You can bring it up later. All right? If you are right and you find out about that, you can always bring that up to them later, and that'll make them a better TO for the future. But for the time being, when they make a ruling and it's final, just accept it. You need can, to do that. I can just feel my ego inflating as you're saying that. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> uh, okay, and this one, this applies to every game of Dominion you will play. It's a little pet peeve of mine, but it's definitely important in a tournament. Oh, man. I know what this is already. Oh. When you're playing your cards, play all of your actions. Don't just resolve them. Actually play them and state the names of them as you do. Put them on the table. Put Af yes. On the on table. On the table. Yes. Put them down on the table where we can see them. Do it. And do the same thing with your treasures. Don't just oh, say, man. okay, I have five money now. And then Don't. like put your hand in your discard pile. And just... Just trust me, do it. And don't get offended if somebody asks you to do it because it's not a trust thing. It's not like somebody thinks you're trying to cheat. We're all human and we all make mistakes. And it's natural to want to try to look at what your opponent's doing and understand how their turns are going, even if you are sure they're doing it right. So just play your turn clearly. I, uh, over half the time when I correct someone, I'm telling them they have more money than, than what they said they had. Like... All right. just, it's it's hard for me to do that when you just flash your hand at me and then put it in your discard pile and say you have money like I'm yeah. not I'm not concerned with making sure that you are not cheating. I mean, if you're if you're going to cheat, I'm not going to play with you anyway, so like If ugh. you feel the need to cheat at Dominion, you clearly need to win the game more than I need you not to win the game. I'm probably <laughs> just going to let you do it. Like, I don't So, so can I talk about uh, tournament stuff now? Oh, yeah, definitely. Cool. So there's, there's two main things that I wanted to talk about. Uh, the first is um, just what's out there in terms of tournaments that you can play for Dominion with physical cards. So, and, and, like, there's a lot of people that are just not aware of this. It's not promoted very heavily, and especially online, it's, it's way off. So please, uh, this is what's going on. There, is, there are officially sanctioned tournaments for dominion sanctioned by the publisher rio grand games i call them rgg for short 
Um, these tournaments have a pretty specific structure. Um, they, they like to have three-player games. Uh, they have as many three-player games as possible, and if it's not a multiple of three, uh, they'll use four-player games. They really don't like to have two-player games. Um, a lot of the tournaments will enforce that they have a multiple of three as the number of players in it so that they can have only three-player games. So, like, the, the one in Ypsilanti, uh, the, the moderator has just a couple people on standby who are willing to play. <laughs> if they need to fill out their numbers or they're willing to just go and do other stuff. Uh, I don't do that for mine, but a lot of people do it. And uh, the official uh, the official stuff at Gen Con, they also do it that way. It's very important to them to have three-player games, uh, not four-player games. Uh, I also want to read you a quote. This is this is something I got from the, um, the, the guy in charge of RGG. His name is Jay. Uh, he's very responsive to emails. And when I was emailing him about... Uh, me putting my first tournament on. I, I want to I wanna read this quote to you directly from him. He says, For sanctioned events, we prefer you arrange that each game is three players and that all players play several rounds with different opponents and then the best players advance to final rounds or a final round, depending on the total number of players. So he's describing Swiss, but uh, three players. And, and so I did ask for clarification on that. Uh, hey, can I do two player games? And he, he came back and he said, we, ask, we do ask that you avoid two-player games. Use four when three is not possible. We also prefer that you break ties when necessary to advance someone with a coin flip. That is what we do. <laughs> and you know okay. what? Like, that's what they do at Gen Con, and I think that's the right thing to do for their Gen Con tournament, and they prefer that, that I do it that way. And I don't do it that way. <laughs> I'm going to have you play a tiebreaker game. Right. I don't understand why you... Of all the ways that you could break a tie, a coin flip, that's the best you could come up with. So so here's the reason why they do it. And, and I'll skip ahead to this. So Actually, let me finish reading the quote. I'll, I'll come back to that. It says, as for the final rounds, we prefer that you not have a final round. Let those who advance play for a few more rounds, and then the player with the highest points is the winner. So they, they really like the Swiss format. They don't like it coming down to one game to rule them all. Um, they said you can sure. do it around or rounds, but like a final round, just one game, is really only for like small tournaments with maybe like nine people in them. Well, what what are they trying to establish with a coin flip, though? Okay, so so here's here's the thing: <clears throat> there is a world championship that happens every year, and the finals of that are at Gen Con. It's a gaming convention in Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, it's not too far from uh, where I am in Cincinnati, and uh, also here's... a lot of fun. You should. Come to yeah, it. Yeah, Gen Con's amazing. So uh, here's the format of it. At the tournament, they have these qualifier rounds on Thursday and Friday, the first two days of the convention. And they're every two hours. You can just walk up and play. There's no charge. And uh, you you just tell the, the moderator that you're there. He sits you at a table. And there are two hours. Th these happen every two hours. And they need to be done after two hours. So you play two games of Dominion. And then uh, if you won both of them, pretty much, uh, and no one else won both of them, then, you know, you, you're, you win that heat and you've qualified for the next stage of the tournament. Normally what happens is that two people won both games because there's like 15 to 18 people at each of these heats. There's a lot of people at these. And then they'll play a tiebreaker game. They will not flip a coin in that instance. Okay. What they're talking about is what happened to me this year. Um, in the first qualifying heat that I played in, I played two games, I won one of them, and then I tied for first in the other game. And, I, I mean, they could give us, they, they could just give us, you know, split the points, but that effectively eliminates both of us. And so, I mean, I'm sitting there, and I said, yes, this is what I want, this is the right thing, and then I'm, like, thinking about it, I'm like, wait a second, just flip a coin, man. <laughs> like, they, they don't have time to play a tiebreaker game. They're doing these every two hours all day for two days. Yeah. So like, and, and the thing is, I lost that coin flip. And so I just went to the next heat, and then I won that one. And then I, I moved on. Like, you can still do that. And so it jives very much with the atmosphere they want in that room. They want anyone to be able to just walk in, sit down at a table, and play an RGG game, even if it's sure. that competitive thing where they can dangle $1,000 in the title in front of you. And, like, that's very much what they want. It's three players fits well into that. And, like, I, I get it. I mean, once I went there, I got it. And I would rather it not have coin flips involved, but, like, 
I get it. I understand it. Yeah, it's kind of representative of how you should look at winning and losing games of Dominion too, just because you didn't <laughs> it's all win. a coin flip. No, I'm kidding. no I, that's not really. I mean, just because, but just because you didn't win any given game doesn't mean that you're a better or worse player for it. Sure. It you can look at your record over multiple games. So you ended up losing a game that you may have had a chance of winning just because of a coin flip, but over multiple games, you still made your way to advance and you won the world championship. That can be representative of somebody who has their chapel, missed the shuffle, and then they think they're a shitty player. No, just look at, just play the next game with those same skills and see how your skill set does over multiple games. Yeah. Sure. I mean, it's unfortunate. Most IRL tournaments, like, there's just not enough time to play enough games to really get that. And so, you know, I, I we, we design kingdoms and filter them so that they kind of are more skill-based. But that's not really possible to do all the time. You shuffle cards. There's randomness. But, I mean, it's, it's the best you can do without, like, having a tournament that lasts multiple days. And uh, you sign up for that. So, so after these qualifier rounds on Thursday and Friday, anyone who wins one of those gets to play on Saturday, Saturday evening. And so all the people who won one of those, they show up, and uh, they have uh, more games of Dominion. I think it was three this time. And everyone plays that many games of Dominion, and we, uh, we, take the, we, we rank the people. And the idea is the top, some number of these, will advance to the finals on Sunday. Now... You can win a satellite tournament to pre-qualify for Sunday, and a lot of people do this, but they want exactly nine people in those finals. And so whoever shows up that's been pre-qualified will get to play, and then, and then the rest of those spots will be filled in by people who showed up, won the heats, and then did well enough on Saturday to make it in. And there are alternates because they really want there to be exactly nine people in the finals. So... Um, these satellite tournaments, you can, you can find them in a couple of places, but if you win a satellite tournament, you get pre-qualified. Um, satellite tournaments that I know of are my own ones that I hold once a year uh, in Cincinnati. There's uh, one at a gaming convention in Ypsilanti, Michigan in November each year. Uh, the convention's called UConn, and uh, they qualify someone. Uh, they like to have one per country, but, I mean... They don't fill out the nine from that, so they're they're nice enough to allow the U.S. to have a couple and support more people doing satellite tournaments. Uh, Japan and Mexico have sent people pretty consistently uh, at their own expense, and you get to go directly into the finals. And I've seen people from uh, other peoples there. I think Sweden had one a couple years ago. Um, just various countries have their own national championships. I don't really know how they work, but they have RGG's blessing, so they're probably three-player games. Um if you don't know of any qualifiers near you, if you're not in the Midwest or you don't know about these things, um, don't be afraid to make your own. I mean, there were there weren't Dominion tournaments happening in Cincinnati, and I wanted there to be, so I started doing it. And like, you can do it too. You can send email to Jay. Uh, his his mail is Rio Games at AOL dot com. I'll put it in the description on YouTube. He's very responsive. He's very friendly, and he wants you to promote dominion so uh, i would highly recommend doing that it's it's not a huge deal if you can find a venue basically like you're most of the way there yeah so uh that's that's most, the official scene yeah well, most game stores are going to be pretty happy about you trying to organize something there too as long as they've got the table space and the availability for yeah. it so don't be afraid to ask your local store owners either because they're more than happy to see anything that brings foot traffic in the door, especially if it's something for a game that they haven't already had a lot of organization for because, yeah. you know, they want to be able to sell more products, different kinds of them. For sure. Yeah, I, I've heard of a lot of people who just can't find a place with more than three tiny mm -hmm. tables and they have a lot of trouble. Yeah, uh, right. Uh, Luckily, we don't have that problem. We live around a few game stores that have you know, pretty vast space, but I, I've got a great venue and I'm really happy with it. They let me do pretty yeah. much whatever I want at this point And <laughs> they have a ton of tables. Yeah. It's really great. You do kind of have free reign. <laughs> I mean, I've held seven successful tournaments, no bigs. So, right. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, anyway, so that's that's the official scene. Um, there are some other things out there that are not RGG sanctioned and part of this structure. Um, I have a three-player tournament that's official that I do every year. However, um, I have other tournaments that I do so that I have a tournament every six months. There's actually one coming up uh, just under two weeks from when we're recording this podcast. It's on January 27th of 2018. It's in Cincinnati, Ohio. If you are anywhere near uh, and you have any any inkling that you might be able to go, let me know, adam at adamhorton.com or any of the other ways you can get in touch with me with the podcast. It would be great to see you. Hashtag shameless plug. But uh, this next tournament that I'm doing is two-player games. I think that three-player games is a valid competitive format for Dominion. I also think the two-players is, and I prefer it. So I have two-player tournaments. These aren't official, but um, I like doing them, and I'm going to continue to do them. So uh, I I also have heard through the rumor mill that uh, Donald, the designer of the game prefers two player in fact like anyone who's done a lot of competitive gaming uh two player is probably the format with the most integrity in my opinion um yeah i think it has a lot of popularity too at people who are really good at dominion that's true uh, the online scene is mostly two player and online helps with that yeah but like magic magic tournaments are everywhere and it's all two player even though you can play magic with three but like it, two players the the one people care about oh uh, and if you're one of those people who plays four player dominion i'm glad you're having fun i am <laughs> but oh my god i don't understand how <laughs> yeah that's uh it's not my thing uh but you know my my personal tournament i i have uh my own format choices that i've made uh for my two-player tournaments i have a few rounds of swiss and then a single elimination bracket at the end because that's exciting uh I well, I think that I think it's a great thing. <laughs> there are some other <laughs> so humble. there are some other characteristics of your tournaments in particular that I personally really enjoy, and oh. I have competed in several of Adam's tournaments. I've won one of them. Um, I usually don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean I usually do like decently well. Um, every now and then I'll pull a win, but and by every now and then I mean I did one time. But anyway. Um, you do something for your tournaments that I think should be required of every Dominion tournament everywhere, and that is that you let people stack their first two hands. Yeah, I, I kind of stole that from uh, Scott, who organizes the tournaments in Ypsilanti. And, and I like that rule for tournament play, not because I think that it decreases the amount of luck, but it makes people feel a lot better. Yeah. Be- because, like, now you can't lose to a 5-2 with Mountebank on the board. Like, it's Pursuits, one of the more... Yeah. yeah, it's one of the more visible forms of luck out there, and it makes people feel really bad when they lose to it. And at the end of the day, I want people to have fun at the tournaments. So, if I can do that and make it more fun, like, I'm gonna do it. Yeah. I don't think it's, it's a also, big deal. The other thing that can be really fun about going to a Dominion tournament is seeing these usually constructed boards that people have come up with. I know Adam takes a lot of time to make his really interesting. And uh, most tournaments are going to, at least for the top few tables, have boards that are constructed with a certain purpose in mind. And seeing how what people have come up with can be a lot of fun. Yeah, so a, a couple tournaments ago, I decided I'll, I'll design a few kingdoms, and it went over really well. It, feedback was overwhelmingly positive. I don't really think I'm that great at kingdom design, so that's why I didn't do it. But I started doing it, and people loved it. So now I'm doing that for all my tournaments uh, in the finals. So I, I'll design four kingdoms that are meant to be played in the finals, and they're completely designed. And it's a great outlet for me to have these evil ideas. And then make people <laughs> play kingdoms about him. Super great. Yeah. He, one of the running themes with Adam's design kingdoms is there's something, there's always something that looks amazing, but some hidden aspect that makes it terrible. <laughs> and <laughs> like we were just talking about him maybe making a kingdom that has <laughs> uh, Phaedom 
and merchant and every piece of silver support you can think of and the whole kingdom is about silver support and then ban it for it just <laughs> ban it for it just makes your life miserable <laughs> screw you <laughs> yeah just good I mean, I, I have fun with the kingdoms and, and you know I, I do summary posts about them so if you're interested in that you'll see it when the tournament's over uh, yeah. for the other kingdoms I like to generate them randomly and then maybe tweak them most of the tweaking I do is so that it's easier for me to do setup uh, if I want like 12 games of Dominion to happen simultaneously and some of my cards are sleeved and some not uh, if I move cards around it makes my life easier so I do it sue me yeah the other thing you tend to you have a de facto ban list you don't come out and say these cards are banned from my tournament but you you have cards you won't play with for your tournaments for kind of practical reasons what are those and why so here i am about to come out and say that these cards are banned because uh, they are and i'm <laughs> i'm happy sharing with this this list i mean i've, I've shared it before um so some of them, some of the cards just take a long time to resolve with physical cards. Scrying Pool, Golem, Hunting Party, Philosopher's Stone. So I just don't put them in the tournaments. I don't think they're bad cards. It's just it's hard to hard to resolve them and hard. It's easy to screw them up. So I just don't put them in. Uh, some of some of the cards you can make are the rounds go to time. <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't want to deal with that. I prefer yeah. the games were shorter. Yeah, because we want to play a lot of them. Some cards are just, like, really strong and swingy, and they make people feel bad, so I don't put them in. So, Swindler, Torturer, Ambassador, Possession, Urchin, Cultist, Rebuild, Page. Yeah, uh, Page is the one that turns into Champion, if you don't know. Yeah, people just feel bad when they lose to these cards a lot, so I just don't include them. Uh, there are two cards that I don't include because they just use too many tokens. And, like... If, if tax is on the board, that's like all my debt tokens. I could have had three other kingdoms with debt in them, and now I have tax. So, like, <laughs> I just don't use tax. And then similarly with peasant, it takes a whole bunch of tokens. I love peasant, but, man, if I can have, like, four other cards where I want them. So, so peasant, I don't include. And then tournament and black market are dumb cards. Yeah, I said it, so I don't include them. And then there's a couple yeah. of... <laughs> They kind of are. Yeah, and then there's uh, Pirate Ship and Cut Purse for the three-player tournaments. I ban those because uh, people feel bad when they're last player and they get hosed by those cards. Yeah. That said, yeah. Uh, for Design Kingdoms, I'll put whatever I want in there. Uh, I had a lovely Ambassador Donate wall game with Soothsayer. <laughs> I love I that, that board. I played that board. It's one of my favorite sets I've ever made. It really needs a three-player game to work. It's just glorious. It was definitely something. Yeah. So uh, that's that's about all I have to say about my tournaments. There's there's some rumors that go around that a lot of IRL tournaments are like, you show up to a place and it's all four player games, base set only, and no one knows what they're doing. And you know those those things exist. I actually went to one at a place uh, near downtownish, and I had a great time. Uh, we, I played four player base games and I had some I had some good talks with the other people there. Um, it was very, very casual and I, I did win the prize. It paid for my parking and the sliders that I felt obligated to buy for dinner, which were delicious, by the way. Nice. And and I felt like I didn't belong there because it was much more casual and I felt like I was coming in and beating up on all these people. And like, yeah, these tournaments are out there and they have their place, but like they're very different from the official scene and like the RGG sanctioned stuff. And then that's also very different than what you see uh, that's along lines of my two player tournaments or maybe what you see online. There's tons of online stuff, which this is not about, but uh, you know, if you want to play with physical cards, there's stuff out there. And if you can't find stuff out there, then go make stuff out there. I have tools yeah. to help you if that's what you need. I have computer programs that'll make your life easier, or I can just give you pointers on how I do things. Um, it's not that hard to do. The publisher will support you if you want them to, and people have like a ton of fun. I, I've I've done seven. I'm having my eighth soon. The crowd is steadily getting bigger. People are traveling in from farther and farther away. I get to see friends I've made that I haven't seen in a while. I, like yeah. I'm legit excited for this. 
Well, you see the same people over and over again at these tournaments, too, because even though the Dominion community is relatively small, it's pretty dedicated. Yeah. I, I wouldn't think twice driving four, four and a half hours from another state for a Dominion tournament. And a lot of people coming in, they feel the same way. Yeah. Well, that's all I have to say on tournaments. Yeah, I mean, they're great things. They're a lot of fun. If you see one happening by you and you're thinking about stopping by, definitely do it. Yeah, Even sure. Oh, hey, uh, one other thing. Definitely do it. And I know <laughs> I already said that, but this that do it was directed at the person who is saying, I don't know if I'm good enough. Um, nobody in the tournament is going to be that I mean, there are going to be people who are really good, sure, but, like, there's nobody... You, you have permission to play in the tournament. It doesn't <laughs> matter what your skill level is, and honestly, that's how you get really good, is by playing against people who are really good. And don't be intimidated. Definitely go in and see where you measure up competitively. I bet it's higher than you think it is. Yeah. And, yeah, that's that's a big thing. I, I bet you're better than you think you are at Dominion. There's the, the tournament is the best way to see that. There's a lot of talent that, that I see at every one of my tournaments now. And I've had seven tournaments, seven different winners, and every single one of them totally deserve it. Like, they played really well. They are very talented. And that's the kind of thing that I see a lot of. But all skill levels are welcome at my tournaments, and they all have fun. And, like, there's, there's a few people I know of that I met at my rock climbing gym, and they're coming. And they're super excited. I, I don't think they played with all the expansions yet, but like, they're going to have fun. They they, it's unlikely that they'll win. Maybe they will, but like, that's not hey, the never point. Never. Like, I, I would you know love what? to see some like secret genius savant dominion player come out of nowhere and pick up the game and just destroy all of us. All right, Carolyn, I'm rooting for you. There you go. Shoutouts. I she's not listening. Oh, was, she doesn't care. Was Carolyn the one that who you were telling me about? Yeah, she's making yeah, cookies. Nice. She's excited, as she should be. Nice. Dominion is amazing. Oh, is she coming? <laughs> oh, yeah, she's bringing two people, too. Oh, I'm excited Oh yeah. to play this, this Carolyn person. Yeah, Savant, you, she's going to wipe the floor with you. I can't wait. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. All right, uh, are you ready for some bread again? Absolutely. I am always ready for bread. Sweet. Uh you want to read this one or you want me to do it? Oh, I can read this one off. So Adam and I, as always, created a kingdom that we are going to play a few games with over the coming weeks so that we have something to open with on next podcast. It is going to involve one of the cards that we spent some time talking about this time so that we can have, have a chance to challenge some of the strategies that we said were good. So this kingdom is contains village bard phaedom smithy tactician beggar haven patrician raise and fool the event and landmark that are available are scouting party and of course bandit fort and because we have fool and one of your coppers is replaced with the heirloom Lucky Coin. <laughs> That's amazing. And if you don't know what Lucky Coin does, it is a copper that every time you play it, you gain a silver. <laughs> oh, it's so good. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's read that again for our audio-only listeners. We have Village, Bard, Theodum, Smithy, Tactician, Beggar, Haven, Patrician, Raise, Fool, our events are Scouting Party and the landmark Bandit Fort. And our heirloom that replaces one of our copper is Lucky Coin. So. Oh, lucky Coin. Oh, uh, yeah, with Bandit Fort. That's so and good. Phantom. Do you go for Phaedom? No. The, okay, spoilers. <laughs> no, you don't go for Phaedom. Hey, if you get all eight Phaedom then uh, your silvers are kind of worth positive points. Yeah, yeah you're, you're breaking even. So, what, <laughs> um, and you have eight green cards in your deck. So what 
do you do here, Adam? What do you, what do you think the goal here is? Uh, well, you want to win and get points. Uh, yeah. Without Bandit Fort, I'm playing something pretty money focused. The thing is, like, the only way to to get provinces here is to buy them. You can't gain them any other way. The only way to get points here, besides Fatum, which no, is yeah, getting right. provinces. You have to buy provinces, and so you need money for that. And how are you gonna get money? So there's copper, and there's emporium, and there's bard. Uh... Well, fool has the potential to give you money in the form of boons, but. It's I mean, Bard not is, very much money. Bard is way better for that purpose because it also yeah. gives you money. So, like, well, yeah. Am I gonna build a village Bard deck? <laughs> oh God, that feels pretty bad. Or maybe like I mean, coming back to Bandit for making all these things that are usually bad into things that are less bad in relation. Like, there's, there's like nothing good to do here. Like, yeah, you can draw yeah. a lot of cards, but like, how are you gonna get a province it feels so bad yeah i mean i feel like oddly enough beggar might factor in because picking up a beggar at least mid to late game is like picking up a gold that isn't a gold sure i i could see myself getting a, a beggar in the mid to late game yeah i don't know if it's worth it before then though i yeah i don't think so either I mean, so I just there... don't. I don't see drawing eight coppers being the best thing you can do here. Can't is it? Is it drawing eight coppers? Is that the best thing you can do? No, I, it can't be. That's it's so bad. I think it might be. It's so bad. Okay, <laughs> I think so. Okay, you 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 need to pick up. You're going to have some silver in your deck from lucky coin, so that takes care of. Yeah, I think he, I don't I'm, think I'm raising that thing the first chance I get. I will raise it eventually, but I'm going to play it a couple once or twice and I'm going to buy a gold or two. And I just Bard, Bard doesn't give you plus buy, does it? No. No. Not the only the, the only plus buy here is tactician, <laughs> tactician. which doesn't doesn't really count as plus buy cuz you there isn't really a way to enable it your tactician turns so it's kind of like you're giving up a buy to get a buy next turn so that's yeah. not really plus buy um well i mean it kind of is but it, it yeah, doesn't work in a way well here. but it doesn't you're not netting buys yeah so well, you are but that it, it's not good here no um yeah so i think that i'm going to play lucky coin a couple of times and eventually buy a gold or two and just eat the bandit for points. And then I'm eventually going to raise them and try to keep raises around as long as I can for a late game silver gold trash and get to five provinces. And I don't think there's much else to do here. Villages and smithies, I think are really good as always. Yeah, I but. think, uh, man, this is tough. I'm probably opening with bard and I guess I'm opening raise. And man, there just isn't anything that's good to do here. I think Bard is going to be important. Maybe I'll get a gold or something, but I think Bard and Copper is going to be most of what I do. I I'm not as warm on the on the golds, but I could see it probably being good. I I think you need one or two. Yeah, like, you could be right. But we're I've... both going to be contesting that province pile, and we're both going to be eating some negative Bandit Fort points. So the person who gets the fifth province, I, I think that person wins. I, I, don't I, think I agree. Yeah. Um, I love Bandit for it. Yeah, <laughs> this board no, it sucks, and I love it. Yeah, it is. Um, I think that I am opening Ray's Smithy. I don't think I, and I do think I'm getting a fool on turn three or four, but I think I'm opening Ray's Smithy. Interesting. I I feel pretty strongly that Bard is a better opening than Smithy. Do you really? Yeah. I understand that they give you similar money output on that early in the game, but I really like moving through my deck quicker with Smithy. I like getting Smithy too, but I think opening for for an opening, I think Bard is better, and then pick up Smithies later. Okay. 
There we go. We've disagreed on something. We did it, guys. <laughs> we made it happen. All right. Well, what's your reasoning behind Bard being better better than Smithy? Smithy's only good if you draw a turn three. It causes that shuffle. It feels so bad. You can draw okay. your raise dead. It feels so bad. You could. I don't know. Smithy's so good, though. I'd... It's OP. Uh, it's true. It is OP. Okay, well, that'll be that'll be a good discussion point for yeah. next time. Is let's both uh, let's both give that a shot and see which one tends to come out on top. Um, I'm seeing Havens actually being decent here because yeah, Havens a great card. Yeah, for de decks that have reliability issues, like the light light big money deck you want to build with Bandit Forts out. They really like those cards that let you seed your hand for next turn at the cost of your hand for this turn. Because, like, buying a gold is better than buying two silvers. And that's just a mild way of putting it. Like, obviously. Yeah. You know. All right. Uh, well, yeah, and uh, let us know what you guys think. Uh, the usual yeah. ways of getting back to us. Uh, we have a, a couple of regulars and, uh, you know, glad to hear from you guys. If, uh, you know, if you're not one of those regulars. Talk to us anyway. Comment on YouTube in the forums, all the stuff. Yep. Come to Adam's house. Um, yeah. Do that. <laughs> okay, so as always, we are going to lead off with next week's raffle. This this week we are going to be giving away a brand new to you PlayStation 2 controller. <laughs> so that's not one you're going to want to miss. And we are very excited to see who gets to walk away with this thing. Brand new to you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening. <laughs>